Hey everybody, it's Paul with Reporting Live from my sofa. How's everyone doing out there today? I'm doing pretty good. Now, as you saw from the title on the thumbnail that you clicked, we are now discussing day four of the Brent Christensen trial. Uh, just a quick recap, this is a federal trial going on right now. The accused is Brent Christensen, the victim is Ying Ying Zong. And we're just gonna review day four now. So without further ado, let's get into it. Now, day four, Monday, the, we start off with, and basically I'm seeing this pattern where we start off with the defense has thrown something out there that the judge has to address, and it's usually a temper tantrum type thing. So the defense wants the judge to compel the University of Illinois to explain why they shouldn't be held in contempt of court because the defense is basically saying they failed to provide documentation that the defense team subpoenaed. And it has to do with uh, Christensen's treatment at the University of Illinois' Counseling Center. And essentially what they're wanting is all the emails and all this kind of stuff. Uh, you know, the, the communication, because what uh, the defense is getting at is that they failed to notify people that he was headed down a path of becoming a, a murderer, essentially, is what took place. And so that's where they open up the very beginning. Now, after that, they continue with uh, Andrew Hugstat, his testimony for part two, essentially. So if you watch the last installment, day three, he was on the stand. He was one of the agents. And so we're just going to continue with that. So he returns to the stand, and that's where they recessed on Friday. And now during his time on the stand on Friday, that's when the they played all the audio recordings between... Brent Christensen and his girlfriend, uh, Tara Bullis is her name. Uh, now remember, she wore a wiretap and got numerous conversations from Brent. And if you haven't watched part three of this or day three testimony, go back and watch that because I mean the stuff that he said is it's just horrible. So let's continue with that. One of the places that Tara Bullis recorded his speech was when they were at the walk for Ying Ying Zong. And Pollock says they didn't play the end of the tape and asked for that to be done now. So they get ready to go do that. And Christensen's wife, Michelle, is giving Christensen and his girlfriend a ride home after they went to the walk. So that's the context. So again, if you remember, Christensen has a wife. They have an open relationship. Christensen now has a girlfriend. Her name is Tara Bullis. So the wife has come to pick them up after they've gone to the walk. So, I mean, again, look at this. He knows he killed her. He's been bragging to the girlfriend the whole time about how he killed this girl. Interesting that he's having that conversation with her and not Michelle, or it makes you wonder if he did, but I don't think he did. So, anyways, but we're about to find out. So, after Michelle picks him up, at some point, Christensen calls one of them Sweetie, the remarks that nobody knows who I'm talking about when I say Sweetie. I assumed you were talking to me, says Michelle. Mm -hmm. Then, Michelle asks if Brent is drunk, and Bulla says he is. At this point, Pollock asks for the WCIA video clip, now a government exhibit, uh, to be pulled up. It shows Christensen and Bullis walking together at Zong's walk. So basically this news reporter and their team or whatever, uh, they happened to get on video before they even knew this, him and his girlfriend walking arm, you know, he had his arm around her. And uh, very eerie. So you can put all this context together and know that that's what they're talking about at the walk on videotape. I mean, it's just so scary. Uh, Pollock points out the red water bottle Christensen is carrying on the side of his backpack and may, brings up, you know, whether it has alcohol in it or not. And Pollock again presses Hugstad about Christensen's recorded claim about the 12 other victims. He testifies that analysts looked into 19 missing person cases in Wisconsin and investigated whether he could have had a hand in them at all, but just nothing seems to come up with that. So... There's no evidence that he killed anyone else. And I think we can see enough of his personality at this point to realize that he's making that up. He just wants to sound like a big, bad, tough guy that goes out and kills innocent women. You know, and maybe men too, I don't know. Uh, okay, now another thing that the defense brings up about this recording, remember they're trying to pick it apart, is that on the recording, Christensen is heard saying that he killed Zong in his bathtub. And they continue to question Hogstadt. Hugstat, not Hogstat, I apologize. They continued to question Hugstat, and he admits that there wasn't any DNA evidence of Zong having been in his bathroom. So, 
I mean, maybe that didn't even happen. I mean, we don't know. Maybe he was able to clean it up really good. I can't imagine that he did. Uh, he does, however, mention that there was evidence Christensen had cleaned the bathroom. So, you know, maybe he did that really well. Hugstat, Hugstat testifies that there were multiple positive DNA test results for Zong in his bedroom. So maybe he just had her in there the whole time. Uh, Pollock then brings up FetLife.com, describing it as like a Facebook for kinky people. And Hugsat agrees with that characterization. Now apparently Christensen was like a member of this you know community or whatever. Pollock says Christensen joined FetLife in April 2017, a few days after he and Bullis first connected. So when he met Tara Bullis, the girlfriend, then he went and signed up for this. Uh, she submitted defense exhibit number one, which was Christensen's login recorded on the site. Pollock says the government has described screenshots of Christensen's activity on the site as doing research on abduction fantasies. And she shows like a spreadsheet of his fat life posts that he made. It basically start so then the defense starts just picking things apart about, you know, DVDs and books, uh, you know, talking about the reasoning that the FBI singled out American science. So now let's fast forward a little bit to one uh, more of the recording, the audio recording. Uh, so they play another clip of that, and this is where Brent calls Michelle and asks her to pick him and his girlfriend up after the walk. He says in their area of Springfield and 3rd, near some basketball courts. The assistant attorney, James Nelson, now takes over some question, more questioning, and he plays another clip from the audio recording, and this is where Brent calls Michelle and asks to be picked up, to pick him and his girlfriend up after they attended this walk. And he tells her where they're at and describes the area to be picked up in. And then he goes into questioning about the 12 victims again, this, you know, claim. And, you know, he says that the FBI can only act on information that they have. And, of course, they have to do that. If somebody's basically, obviously killed someone and making claims they killed 12 other people, well, of course they're going to look into that. And I think it's silly for the defense to try and say no. I mean... You know, I get where they're going. You don't want to bias a jury, but it's, you know, I mean, there's, he's already done that himself, in my opinion. But basically, you know, it says, you know, it's not impossible that Christensen killed these people, but there's no evidence supporting that. He then says, you know, they talk about the, the search warrant that they got for Facebook and text messages uh, or Facebook messenger. They show these things. Uh, and in them, it says, so in these messages, it kind of shows that he's exploring BDSM. And all these repressed emotions and desires were slowly corroding in my mind, he typed in one message. So he has these, you know, and again, to each their own or whatever. I feel bad when things like this, because, you know, if you're into BDSM, great, fine, have fun with it. Um, but then when you get these people in here who, it, it, it goes into these different communities and it gives them a bad name, you know, so... Uh, Hugstat testifies that investigators must have reviewed hundreds of hours of surveillance video. They searched tons of land, uh, you know, man hours, but put man hours looking for Zong's body, and they still cannot find the body. So uh, now the attorney sits down, and the defense gets up to re to recross Hugstat again. And they start off with, when was the last time you and Mr. Christensen hung out at a bar and got drunk, she asked him. Never, says Hugstad. Pollock says that, therefore, he wouldn't know what type of drunk Christensen is. She, she suggests that people sometimes say things online that aren't entirely accurate. Hugstad agrees. And yes. And I mean, from this, we can see that he he's a bragger. You know what I mean? He's just... he's playing this up and bragging about disgusting things. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, he's, this is your typical online person probably. So we can't really believe a word that he says. So you have to look in between the, in between the lines here with him a lot. Okay. So now they, they finally let Huck stand off the stand. I'm sure he was glad. And they call up another witness, William O'Sullivan. And he is a senior forensic examiner at the FBI uh, in Springfield. And he analyzes digital data. So basically, he just goes into how he, uh, you know, processes the data that he extracts from different digital, you know, media and things of this nature. And the conversation gets steered toward the FetLife profile, Christensen's FetLife profile. And they show screenshots of Christensen's activity on the site. And his username is Akuma689. Now, the 689 he was also using in the other thing, Love Machine or whatever, one of his, uh, like, romantic profiles. I don't know what Akuma is, so I'll have to look that up. Uh, I want to test my limits, Christensen says in his profile, saying he wants to experience more. 
Uh, Christensen messaged a user to respond to their post about a rape kidnapping fetish post, and the two discussed how they would go about acting one out. Uh, Christian says he'd break into their house, bind them and put them in a duffel bag, then into his car and possibly to a motel after that. Uh, the user responded saying the timing of him being able to abduct them from their home could be tricky. Christensen says he's been working out ways to do it, saying he would drive on the back roads or go out to a park. Uh, the two discuss a possible letter of consent in case the police came involved. I mean, this is very interesting. Uh, O'Sullivan testifies that the FBI didn't recover any relevant location data on Christensen's phone. So now let's backtrack a little bit to this conversation. So you see the fantasies that he's having and whatnot. And again, if those are his fantasies, okay, you know, I get it. But he clearly went into the reality of acting these things out. And this poor girl who was not a willing participant in this, obviously... God only knows what he did. He probably was like a kid in a candy store, finally living out these morbid fantasies that he's having and, and, and taking it out on this innocent victim. So another thing that O'Sullivan testifies about is they have records showing Christensen downloaded articles like on the minds of serial killers, human consumption, excuse me, human decom decomposition, pornographic photographs of women in bondage, um, and so they just found like loads of this. And so again, we can see this pattern forming with him talking about his fixation with serial killers and things of this nature. And he had these hidden in a lap in a uh, folder on his laptop. And so they show the court, the photos, the poor courtroom, my gosh. So they also show the history about how he looked up, uh, Wikipedia articles on serial killers, uh, the number of victims they had. He also viewed Abduction 101 on Fet Life, as well as articles on how to plan a kidnapping and abduction play. So he was preparing for this, and something about it made him go out and just get a real victim. Uh, he also searched for sharp knife sharpening. Uh, then they show some text messages that he sent to his girlfriend, Tara Bolas, telling her he bought restraints, a blindfold, a gag. So it sounds like she was very willing to try this kind of stuff out with him. And the two of them discuss that he's planning to drink during the day and he wants her to join him. I won't company Christensen text her because then instead of becoming a sociopath, I'm in a good mood and I have a good time with someone. I mean, is that not telling? Because remember, he committed this crime when his wife was gone and obviously the girlfriend was somewhere. Uh, he also texts her, fading into nothingness is the default for most people. If you want to know what terrifies me, it's that. I will not fade away. I refuse. I don't care how I'm remembered, just that I am. I would rather destroy than humanity than let that happen. So, I mean, you see all these things compounding. I mean, this is more, I mean, this is, if somebody texted this to me, I, first of all, like, I'm even trying to think anybody I know would text this to me. I mean, I would just be like, what? Are you joking? So, uh, I mean, I just can't even wrap my mind around something like this. I would be like, what are you on? Uh, Christian texts her to also mention the people he says have looked at him recently all seem afraid. I don't want fear, he texts her. He tells her he doesn't want to transition his way of life now that he's graduating. He refers to his lifestyle over the last eight years, his heavy drinking. He doesn't think he can transition into an eight to five job. And you won't have to worry about that anymore. I mean, it, it's just, it blows my mind. I know I keep saying that over and over, but it, it just, it's so, this guy is so full of himself. You know, people are really scared when they're looking at me. I'm like, I don't think so. They probably sense the crazy I love you. So, okay, now the day that Zong was abducted, O'Sullivan testified as to what Christensen's last recovered texts were before it happened. And he texted Bullas. You don't do the any... He texted Bullas. You don't do the anything casual thing. From breathing to fine dining to murder. You're unique, he texted her. And in a weird, unique situation, it makes you my kitten. Bullis texts Christensen saying she's indulging in my friskiness with another man. I mean, that's what she wrote back. I'm just... <laughs> now, again, they might have this understanding. You know what a lot of this sounds like to me? Because, like, I've... I mean, I've known people who have done, like, the, uh, the polyamorous situations and things of that nature. Um... It sounds to me like he's somebody who went along with it to keep people in his life, but he was not cool with it. And it, like, ran all over him. Because look at how, listen to how egotistical he is. You know what I mean? It's just, like, everything's, like, very ego-driven. And so when he has, like, his wife's off at their honeymoon place with another guy, his girlfriend's over here doing this, and he keeps saying that he can't be left alone or becomes a sociopath. And clearly he was not lying.
Throughout the afternoon, the record shows Michelle texted Brent, and the content of those messages was redacted in the uh, FBI report. And she texted him at 3.51 p.m., an hour or two after Zung was abducted, and the message was redacted. Uh, 4.53, he texts Bullis, how is your day? I'm exhausted. O'Sullivan testifies that their court records show he opened several pornographic files and websites that evening. The next morning, Christensen started searching for Ying Ying Zong's search updates. So he was getting off on this oh, immediately. He was like, I've done this. This is like a big thing now. Uh, after the FBI started canvassing Saturn Astra owners, he texted Bullis. The FBI, he was just here looking for a missing girl. Apparently, she got into a black Astra Friday morning. It hasn't made any sense. That's odd, Bullis says in a response at one point. And listen to the text messages she responds back. She doesn't sound that invested in him at all. You know, that's odd. And maybe she was sensing his weirdness. Or maybe this was like more of a hookup type situation for her. Because she just doesn't seem to... I mean, granted, we're only seeing certain things here. But it, there just doesn't seem to be much of a... You know, if somebody wrote that to me, oh, that's weird. What'd they say? I want to know more. Throughout the next several days, Christensen continued to search for updates. Uh, updated search history shows he also looked up sodium hypochlorite, which O'Sullivan says is a chemical name for bleach. Uh, Pollock then cross-examines O'Sullivan, and she says that Christensen either is or was in a class about sociology during the spring semester, which could explain his downloading of the research on serial killers. I mean, honestly, it's like, they pick these little things to try and explain away, and I'm like, it doesn't really matter if he looked up 100 serial killers or if he didn't. You know what I mean? Uh, she establishes that the FBI had no idea whether he was drunk or not when he was looking at these articles. And then the, looking at a spreadsheet of Christensen's digital activity, she confirms with O'Sullivan that he was only on a Wikipedia page for serial killers for 31 seconds. Uh, and then another one for about a minute. And Paul like, basically tries to get some context put into here with O'Sullivan and gets him to admit that the amount of porn that Christensen had on his computer was pretty much very small and that only a few images depicted, you know, were depicted of women in bondage. So she's just trying to kind of like minimize the stuff. And, and so O'Sullivan does agree that most of the porn on his computer was vanilla. Uh, only a small percentage was shocking. Okay. And also, she has, uh, Pollock points out that according to the FBI's log, he really didn't seem to spend that much time on FetLife looking at abduction Q&A. And also brings up the fact that Christensen discussed having a written consent form with the user he was talking to about the abduction fantasy. Pollock also has O'Sullivan confirm that there are thousands of text messages between Christian and Bullis, yet only a handful. Okay, so this answers my question. Yet only a handful were listed in the report the court saw. Which, okay, so they were, I mean, who knows what they were talking about then. But that answers why there just seemed to be no interest in anything he says. Uh, are you familiar with SpongeBob SquarePants? She asked O'Sullivan at one point. She points out that Christensen's text to Bullis about breathing, to fine dining, to murder is a reference to a SpongeBob episode. And the reporter says that they've seen that and can confirm that. So then the state attorney, the, sorry, the federal, the, the, the government attorney gets back up there and gets O'Sullivan to testify that it's not common for him to come across evidence of research on serial killers when he's mining for data. Which, God, I mean, y'all, if any of us out here in the true crime community, our computers, I mean, can you imagine all the research we do? So we're going to conclude this video here. Basically, it ends right here. They haven't uploaded the remaining notes from that day. So this will probably be like a sequel to it if there's something worthy of talking about. Um, so that's it. We're going to end this here. And stay tuned for the next episode in this drama. I appreciate you hanging with me. And I will talk to you soon. Bye.